Amen. Man, we have had an awesome time, haven't we? Man, it's been powerful. You know, let me just mention, you can be seated. Let me just mention a couple of things here. I've been teaching on the old man is dead and I've got a little booklet on that and it's, got, it's entitled The Old Man is Dead, Goodbye and Good Riddance. And this is just a little 50 something page uh, summary of the things we were talking about. And then I wanted to mention this. This is 20 revelations that will change your life. And this is something we put out last year. Uh, two weeks from today will be the 56th anniversary of when the Lord changed my life. And so as we were celebrating 55 years last year, uh, Mike Pickett just suggested that, you know, you ought to take some of the main revelations that God has given you and just uh, kind of put them together. So I did, and this is nearly like a very small semi-autobiographical. -auto, uh, I don't even know how to say that. Autobiography. And it, and it sequenced the first things that the Lord showed me. One of the first revelation that really uh, began the whole thing was when I saw that there was a hell. And then I understood grace and things like this. And so these are just 20 revelations that will change your life. And so these are little booklets that we have and those will be a real blessing. I'll let uh, Matt give these away to somebody if they would like them. And we are blessed to have Brother Dave Hinton back with us, man. We love you, Dave. Love you too, Dave. Isn't he a blessing? So anyway, Dave's going to minister to us, and then I'll come back and share the word. All right. Anybody in here love Jesus? Thank you, Father. You, you know, I don't, don't need a lot of explanation, but I just wanted to say that the amazing grace thing that I do quite often is not just a part of the show, but we're in prisons, we're on the streets, and we're in outreach positions and places where people won't really stay around for bringing in the sheaves. And, uh, but when I start doing the amazing grace stuff and they recognize the old songs, they hang around and guess what? They hear the message of grace all those times, and then we zero in on what that grace is all about, what God provided through Jesus Christ on the cross and his death, amen? And uh, the power in the blood of Jesus. So uh, I always enjoy doing it, and I love the response. But I want you to know that where, where we do that most is in the marketplace and in ministry and outreach. And we see uh, all of a sudden it's like a scanner on people's faces, uh, when they start uh, realizing, hey, it's not religion. It's not just, you know, club and a click and some religious thing that you do, but it's actually uh, a life impacting, life changing power of God moment when you receive what God has done for you through our Lord. Amen. And, and so I love doing it and I guess I always will. Um, I'm going to do a song. I don't know. I tried it the other day, but let me try to get through this. And I hope you can hear the message and the heart behind it. But uh, I've needed healing and I uh, wrestled with things and I've been healed and then gone through something else. And many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And you don't have to live there. You don't have to stay there. And I found God to be faithful. In, in every situation and I've learned, praise God, to get the promise of God and stand on that promise and not be moved, not be shaken from it. It's like the old song says, I, I'm standing on the promises that cannot fail. Though the howling winds of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God, I shall prevail. Cause I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. <laughs> Sing the chorus with me. I'm standing, I'm standing. I'm standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior. Standing, 
I'm standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Oh, I'm standing on the promises of God. And I speak to myself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I won't let my heart be troubled by anything that's wrong. I'm troubled on every side, yet I am not distressed. But I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm happy, and I'm blessed. Amen. I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm happy, and I'm blessed. I've cast off all fear and worry and entered into God's rest. My tears are turned to laughter. Yes, I'm happy ever after. I've entered into God's great righteousness, not mine. And I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm happy, and I'm blessed. Amen. And, and so it's important that you speak to yourself. If you don't sing, it doesn't matter. Get in the shower, you can sing as loud as you want to. Um, um, Andrew always says he'll put on Charlie and Jill and turn it up so loud that he sings and it just sounds like his voice singing, amen? And, and I'm telling you, you can, you can think yourself happy. You can think yourself whole and healed. You don't have to imagine uh, dark things and bad things and bad reports, but just begin to declare something like that. Uh, God told me back before we uh, had this artery surgery. He said, you're healed, you're whole, and you're blessed. So I just began declaring that and through all that. And then one day I, I heard myself saying that I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm blessed. And it sounded like uh, Dr. Phil's voice said, how does that make you feel? <laughs> and I said, well, it makes me happy. It is the Lord, it wasn't Phil. And, and I said, it makes me happy. And so I just added that I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm happy, praise God, and I'm blessed. Thank you, Jesus. What if he's gonna die? Wouldn't you rather die happy than sad? A friend of mine, they said he's dying, gave him two days. I went to the hospital and, and he's, uh, they got him up on the edge of the bed. And I said, Larry, I said, I heard they gave you two days to live. All the family gathered. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm here to tell you, you can live three days. Isn't three better than two? Might have someone to call, might have something to do, praise God. And I said, I, I believe we can keep you around here four days. Man, I mean, people, you talk about fiery darts, you know, people are looking at me like, how dare you come in here and act like that? And I said, Larry, I said, with the faith you've got in God and the faith I have, I said, I bet you we can keep you around here five or six days. And, and I'll never forget a smile came over his face and he shook his head. And, and I know because he knew me and he knew only, only uh, someone like me would come in and declare, isn't five better than two? You know what? We got it up to 90 days. He went home. He laid hands on his four sons and blessed them. He made some things right that he felt like needed to be made right. And he went home with a shout. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. So I'm just going to minister a couple of songs to you here. Don't you love it? Work in Jesus' name. You speak to yourself. I can do all things. Through Christ which strengthens me and I can move mountains Cast them into the sea 
I can be the kind of man that Jesus says I can be and I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Without a formal education, they said you'll never get too far. Your fingers are too fat to play piano or guitar. Well, you think that's mean you should have seen and heard their doubtful speech when I told them that I heard God's voice telling me I was called to preach. Well, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me and I can move mountains cast him into the sea and I can be the kind of man that Jesus says I can be and I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me the key is in believing if you believe you can or if you believe you can't you're right amen I am so glad I believed And I am so glad I opened up my heart to receive Cause I can do all things Through Christ which strengthens me And I can move mountains and Cast them into the sea And I can be the kind of man that Jesus says I can be and I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Sing that line with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, he strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus strengthens me and I can do all things. I can do all things. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do all things. Through Christ which strengthens me and I can move mountains. Cast him into the sea and I can be the kind of man that Jesus says. I can be and I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Thank you, Jesus. Sing that verse of scripture with me. Let it get down into your heart. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Oh, he strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me Jesus strengthens me and I can do all things 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 through Christ which strengthens me and I can move mountains cast him into the sea I can be the kind of man that Jesus says I can be and I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Better not try. Amen. Praise God. So let me ask you a question sitting here under the word this week. Has anything changed? Amen. If you came strong and on top of the mountain working your way up, has anything changed? Praise God. We just keep growing stronger and stronger and stronger as we open up our heart to the Word of God and the anointing of God on God's servants. Praise God. Got a lot of things I came here with that, that I just leave in here. Amen. Praise God, and I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm blessed. I'm happy and I'm blessed. And I've had a manifestation of healing, Andrew, amen. I mean, I, I can't even describe, you can. It's like ice cream. Can you describe ice cream? It's cold, it's creamy, it's sweet. 
but you really need to taste and see that is really good. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. My wife, she don't, she don't, she don't uh, go with this, but I believe ice cream is very healthy for you. I don't get a lot of it, but. And she says, how is it healthy for you? I said, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And ice cream makes my heart merry, <laughs> amen. So, all right, I'm gonna do this and get out of here. And thank you, Andrew, again, for letting me be a part. What a deal, praise God. And if someday way down the road, you hear old Dave Hinton's gone, just know I went with the shout, amen. <laughs> And God promised me laying in ICU, he said, you're gonna to live to be an old man. I think I'll take his word, amen. I wrote it that way. <laughs> There's been a change in me. Jesus saved my soul. He set my captive spirit free. There's been a change in me. This world can't understand the change he made in me but there's been a change there's been a great change in me there's been a change in me he's rearranging me he's gonna make me like the son he sent to die on Calvary the one who said me free bought my victory and I'm going to sing his praises all throughout eternity there's been a change in me oh Jesus saved my soul set my captive spirit free there's been a change in me my friends can't understand the change he made in me but there's been a change there's been a great change in me yeah 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 there's been a change yeah 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 there's been a change the devil don't like it but there's been a change uh-huh Huh? You really thought he had me, but he didn't. There's been a change in me, a change in me. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And you know what that is? That's cowboy rap. Well, there's been a change in me. Oh, Jesus saved my soul, set my captive spirit free. There's been a change in me this world will never understand the change he made in me but there's been a change there's been a great change in me there's been a change amen <laughs> praise God God bless y'all don't let us take anything home from the table back there. It's all back there. And, and uh, if there's songs we did and that we don't have on the table, if you'll uh, send us a text or whatever, we, as soon as we have those available, we'll send them to you. Postage paid, amen? No charge. And uh, God said there'd be seed that got caught in the wind and I'd never know where they went. And they're all over the world. Praise God, <laughs> amen? Folks singing, don't smoke, it'll make you croak. Thank you, Andrew. God bless you. Give the Lord another shout of praise. Praise the Lord. Thank you, David. That's awesome.
You know, my granddaughter, when she was just real little, I think four or five, she got that little uh, CD about don't smoke, it'll make you croak. And anyway, Dave was out at our house and uh, we had a number of people out there and we were around a fire pit and we were singing and she says, sing number three. He didn't know what number three was, but she had memorized it and she had everything down and she loved that. So it's really good. Man, I just appreciate so much all of you coming. It's been a great, great conference. I appreciate all of our staff. They've done a, a great job. And, and last night I actually asked who it was that was putting the scriptures up. And they, I, I was told it was Inya. Are you up there? You are doing a great job. Man, that was awesome. Todd was rattling off those scriptures last night and not even giving the reference where they were. And they were up there. And I thought somebody knows the word of God. That's really good. So I was thrilled with that. You know, I'd like, we're going to give you one last opportunity to give and to be a part of this and so they can uh, pass out some offering envelopes. But let me uh, encourage you, if you haven't considered being a partner, I would like to encourage you to do that. Of course, it's obvious how partnership helps us. We consider a partner a person who not just gives occasionally, but a person who is committed to this ministry and giving. You know, we have... Uh, counting our overseas partners, about 70, just under 70,000 partners in the ministry. And they provide somewhere around $3 million a month, which is our, uh, you know, we have to have about eight and a half million. We need to go up to 10 and a half million, but uh, they provide 30, 40% of our income. And you know, our bills come in on a monthly basis. It's amazing how that works. <laughs> But when people give one time, we appreciate that and God will bless it. But did you know, if it wasn't for partners that provide us with this foundation, we couldn't do what we're doing. And I just want to mention to you, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but in Philippians chapter one, Paul was thanking God every time he thought of the Philippians. And he says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And the word fellowship there in the Greek is the Greek word koinonia. And that word means partnership is what it means. The Philippians were partners with Paul. And if you turn over to the fourth chapter, you can see this because he says in Philippians chapter four and in verse 15, he says, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. And also, if you turn over to uh, Matthew, cha I mean, excuse me, Acts chapter 28 and read when Paul was in prison in Rome, he gained favor with the people and they allowed him to stay in a hired house for two years while he was in prison. How does a prisoner pray for a house? It was partners. And these people, this is what occasioned this whole thing. He had received, it says over here in the fourth chapter in verse 10, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. So even in Rome, they had heard about him and here they were sending to him again. And these Philippians were the ones that paid for his house so that for two years while he was in prison, they took care of him. And because of that, many people missed this. But some of the promises here in the book of Philippians are two partners. For instance, Philippians 1, 6, being confident in this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know some people think that they just apply that towards everybody? I believe that God wants to continue a good work in every single person, but it takes some cooperation on your part to make this happen. And Paul was saying to people who were partners, that God is going to complete the good work that he began. And then over here, Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. People just apply that to every single Christian. Again, I believe that God wants to do it, but you have to cooperate. You have to receive. And when you become a partner, what you're doing, you are going beyond just 
you know, giving every once in a while, giving maybe when a request is made or something like that, but you are committing yourself and providing a foundation and helping get the gospel out. And over in Romans chapter 10, Paul said, how could we preach if we weren't sin? How can we sin unless somebody gives to us and stuff? So uh, anyway, you, when you become a partner, it just moves you to a different level. It's not about you. It's about getting the gospel out and sharing with other people. And I can promise you that it's only what we give away that you really get to keep. Everything that you keep is going to someday be totally gone. But what you sow into the gospel and we use it to preach the gospel and to reach people, did you know that the changed lives, you, that'll never leave. It'll never leave your life. And when you get into eternity, you're going to have people there that welcome you in and thank you for giving. You know, God has really blessed us with a, a television ministry that reaches over 5 billion people around the world. We have uh, offices, and I think Mike says 22, 21, 22 countries and schools, and we're reaching people all over the world. So when you sow into this ministry, you're helping us reach people. And I tell you, only eternity is going to reveal exactly the full impact of it, but it's going to be big. So I would just like to encourage you to consider be about becoming a regular monthly partner with us. That's really what makes this ministry work. And uh, we are, we're in the process of making some decisions, had some meetings this week, and we're going to need an extra two to three million dollars per month <laughs> to get done what God is telling us to do. No problem. No problem. We just had our electric company say that they were going to charge us $12 million cash up front to run electricity to all the stuff we want to build. And we aren't accepting that. We're going to do something. I'm not believing we're going to have to do that. But that's the kind of things that we're dealing with, and we couldn't do that without people helping us. So I just ask you to join with us. And if you do that, then I believe that God is going to supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. Amen. So, Father, we love you and we thank you for loving us. Thank you for everything you've done for us, Father. We are just so thankful. Thank you for being here with us and all of the people that have been ministered to, the lives that have been changed. And, Father, the ripple effects of this it will go out through our families, through our businesses, and just make a huge difference. Father, we give you praise in advance. And I pray for people who want to join with us on a regular basis that, Father, you would touch people's hearts and that as they give, that, Father, it'll just come back to them and that you will prosper them a hundredfold in this life. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Praise God. Billy, would you come up here for just a second? Uh, if you'll take that mic. Uh, many of you heard Billy at the workshop, but Billy Epperhart here is the CEO of our ministry. He pastored three churches for how many years? 20 years or something? Yeah, over 20 years. Over 20 years. And then he left and went into real estate, has become a very successful businessman, has a number of different corporations, micro loans that he gives out in different places around the world, doing really good. And, and uh, he's been with us for how long? Uh, I first came with Paul, the first time I taught was 2011. So man, that's been 20, uh, 13 years. 13 years, yeah. That's awesome. And time. I knew about Billy. I'd heard about him. There was fr mutual friends that told me about him, but I really didn't know him. And when he came here and started ministering in the business school is when we began to get to know each other. And then uh, he was a good friend of our previous CEO, Paul Milligan. And Paul had some physical problems. And so Billy stepped in and kind of took over and then Paul uh, just literally had to withdraw. Now he's been restored, praise God. Yeah, he's back. Mean, he's like doing he just, good. He just emailed me yesterday, so he's yeah. doing good. He's doing good. But anyway, Billy stepped in and Billy has taken us to another level. What's happening with the ministry? I just felt like having you. Because, I you want y'all to know, I, he I didn't tell about, me he's bringing me up here. I'm I talk <laughs> about the ministry and people sometimes think that I'm blowing smoke. But... Well, uh, you know, I think it's really awesome what God's doing. No, I mean, it's amazing to see 
And if we're talking because of my role as CEO, I deal a lot with the finances and, and the personnel, the people. But really, if you see the blessing of the Lord financially, in fact, in the second workshop yesterday, I started off talking about the importance of partnering with the ministry here, becoming a partner and being a partner financially, because I believe where you sow, right, where you sow, there's a direct connection in your faith to the anointing that comes on you. And what we see here happening now is that we have, we've been spending, I said this when I was sharing this, we, we're spending about $2 million a month on construction only, just on construction alone. And so that's quite a bit of cash flow, but the Lord spoke to you about speeding up the process. And so just this week, we had a major meeting with, uh, with all the powers that be in the ministry and some outside uh, to see how much do we need to be able to get all of the student housing completely finished and people moving into it by August of 2025. And that's a lot. If you don't know, that's a lot. That's a lot. And then in addition to that, if I can talk about this, sure. we're standing up a 24-hour, which will eventually be worldwide. We're calling it a satellite network, but it's a, we call it the Gospel Truth Network. And we're, we're setting that up. And believe me, that's quite expensive to get all of that going in the way of what you've seen. But did you know it's actually going to be less expensive than what we're paying, paying right TV. now for this five million, five billion people coverage that we right. have? We can do the same thing through our own network for uh, probably what, 60, 70 percent right. of what we're paying right now. Now, we aren't going to quit what we've got because those networks have taken years to build up their thing. And yeah, it'll we're going to keep us, both, right. And it'll take us, but we are going to start this network and it's going to be somewhere when we get the whole thing stood up about 1.3 to 1.4 million a month. Yeah, that, and, and that would mean that actually on television, right, television itself, it's in the high two millions. We would be in the high two millions just on airtime alone. So when you start looking, a lot of people don't know this, Andrew, about you and your ministry, but um, I know Todd, I've been, he, he's approached me, in fact, he texted me this morning, but he's been asking for advice on his ministry. If you look at how the Lord has led, I call him Big Andrew, if you, you see how the Lord's led Big Andrew to build this ministry and structure it, you truly do see the wisdom of God in the way the connection has been made with people who support us. And today, at the level of income that comes in here, I'm just going to tell you, I did some calculation in my office this week, and I'm not kidding. Right now, our budget's about $120 million a year to just do what we need to do moving forward with all this stuff we're talking about. The ministry here is going to have to at least grow, at least grow to $160 million a year just to do the basics of what we need. So we need people from all over the world partnering here, and I could easily see it getting quite a bit larger just based on I where we're we'll headed. I believe it will be $200 million a year. We have to Not be. too long from now. Yeah. In order to get the building done, these first six dorms are going to be what? Is it 56 or 58 million? Yeah, they went from, on John, they, we went from about. Here's our builder right here. Raise your hand, John. John, stand up. Yeah, stand up, and John. Stand no, up, John. stand up. We want you to stand up. This is our builder. Yeah. Yeah. And let me just say, you know, I hate to embarrass him, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> But John is the one that was head of the sphere. Is that what it's called in Las Vegas? What's it called? Sphere. The what? The sphere. MSG. MSG sphere in Las Vegas. And it was how much the total project? 1.3 billion. 1.3? 2.3 billion dollars. It's how many stories? 14? 360 feet high and 500 feet, 160 feet in diameter. Anyway, they were spending up to on some time. <laughs> It's a sphere. <laughs> and the whole thing is LED screens outside and inside. And, inside. Yeah. and if you ever look it up, they, I've seen it where they have an eyeball that looks and follows you around. And, <laughs> and then inside, it's an entertainment thing. They were spending sometimes $50 million a month at the height of it, I think. A lot. And he was a partner with us and just decided to come help us. We Amen. couldn't have gone out and got him to do it. And he's the one that's doing our building. What a blessing.
And Billy's the same way. And on and on you could go. We've got some of the most talented people. Absolutely. People got, like John. We've got a guy. Mom. I know that I hate to start pointing out people because there's just so many things. But we've got one guy in our IT department that graduated cum laude or whatever you say from uh, Harvard, I think it was, in yep. IT and stuff. And the guy uh, had problems from uh, being in the military and couldn't think, had brain damage and got totally healed and now he's working for us and the guy's an absolute genius and he could be making two or three times as much money. And our, our CFO was a CFO for Bell South as they became AT&T. So the Lord has truly sent, and there's others we could go on and oh, talk yeah. about. So anyway, we were brought. talking about that this is gonna be 56 million just to get these dorms yeah. done and then we've got a, a, a student activity center over here. It's gonna be 340 a uh, thousand square feet and what do you estimate that's going to cost? Well, on the low end, John's been going up on me, so um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I get Billy's calculation, not John's. Billy's, Billy's calcul calculations are a lot more than mine. Yeah. So if <laughs> I think, I, honestly, I think that building will cost a minimum of 170 million. One building. Just one building. I think, yeah, see, look at John. Now he's giving me a thumbs up because he came and got in my pocket at 130 million. And then we've got Next our, time I saw him, it was 140 we've million. We've got our athletic center that's going to have all kinds of stuff in it, and it's going to be 440,000 square feet that, down in the parking garage. What's that going to cost? Well, I'm afraid, well, by the grace of God. <laughs> it's going to cost more than we got. I think, I hope. <laughs> But anyway, no, I'm <laughs> I know just, I know what you're saying. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. And then we got a hotel and conference center that we're going to build. It'll uh, uh, have 300 or 350 rooms in it, which will be a big help on conferences like Absolutely. this. Plus, all of our students. We're building this to accommodate a minimum of 2,500 students. And then the students, you know, they, they have family that come visit them and graduation and different things. And so we need this. And during times that we aren't holding conferences, we'll rent it out to other people. Amen. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful facility. And, we, and it's over on the North Campus. And you really have identified, and we've identified another, uh, in addition to what we're doing now, there's another 12 to 15 of the student dorms. Oh, yeah. Then on the north side of the building, which we call the north side, way back, this is across Trout Creek. If some of you don't know this, we actually have two campuses. So the campus you're sitting on here is 157 acres, and the campus across is 300 and now. 36. Yeah, well, it was, more, but uh, we added some, so it's 360. It's 200, it's 527 acres altogether. Yeah, altogether. So we're putting a bridge. There'll be a large uh, bridge that will carry the vehicles, you know, you can drive across for students and, and all of you that you can drive across in the other part. So both campuses connect. So when we start looking at how all of that gets developed, you know, we're, we're saying now for the for the campus to happen in the next 10 years, which is the goal, uh, we will spend a billion dollars or more just on the building the campus here. So there's quite a vision and, it, and very candidly, it's quite a challenge, but I'm telling you, the Lord has supplied every need we have Amen. needed. It's been amazing to see what the Lord has done. And last thing before I let you go, this is something that some of you might be interested in, but last year, my staff, uh, we had a program about people giving in wills and things like that, but it had never gained much traction. And last year, I think it was last, uh, or a year ago, August, so it's getting towards two years now, they really made a push on this. And in the last year and a half, we've had how much? $150 million. million pledge through uh, wills. And yeah, and, and we think it's around, we've had 150 million that has been specifically designated. And that's not just somebody writing, that. that's conversations back and forth with people that we've identified. So we know probably some of you have done that that are in here. We want you to know we appreciate it and on live stream. But really that, that uh, legacy giving is what we call that. That legacy giving has become a key part to what we see happening in the future here, both for the sustainability of Karis 
as well as getting the campus itself built out. So if you'd like to contact us through our partner relations office, you can do that and you can set up, put it in your will. You can, you know, what, however your estate plan is working, it can be a simple will or a full-blown estate plan. We also have the free will that we do here at the ministry that they'll take care of you. Doesn't cost you a penny to do a will and you can actually designate as a part of our program for legacy giving. So we have two things that but you can do But it's not that. required that you give to our ministry. No, you don't it's have free to free will will help you set up a will whether you designate us or not. So That's everybody correct. ought to do something like that. Absolutely, matter of fact, it free and so you call and we'll we put you in connection with the folk and so all of you I, as I look around I see a, a lot of gray hair but even the young young men in here all of you need to have a will you need to you need to be smart about what you're doing in regards to those things and so that's provided here from the ministry with professionals that's free of charge amen thank you Billy I just uh I just felt impressed to have him come up here and um, share some of those things. And, you know, we didn't even plan on this. It's just one of those blessings of God. But this legacy giving, if we anticipate this building uh, that we're doing costing a billion dollars, the legacy giving at the rate we've had it come in in the last year, it will supply that whole billion dollars. Of course, it's not uh, money that we have in hand, but I can guarantee you, it's like Dave Hinton said that, 10 out of 10 are guaranteed to die. So <laughs> eventually that money will come in. And so that's just going to be awesome. Amen. Let me finish up here with uh, Romans. I was sharing things out of Romans uh, chapter 6, talking about the old man dead. And I'm not going to go back through all of that. But after I shared the things that this old man is dead, your nature has been changed. You do not have dual natures. The only reason that we still seem to be controlled by our life the way it was before we got saved is because we haven't renewed our mind. The nature that programmed us and drove us to this is gone and you are free. You have been freed is what it says in verse 7, but whether you walk free or not depends on whether you renew your mind. And that's what we've been doing this week. And it has been powerful. I really believe that this is going to be a turning point in many people's lives, that you're never going to be the same. You know, you can't operate in what you don't know. That's a, that's a strong statement, and it's not everybody agrees with that. You can have an encounter with the Lord, and you can have God touch you, but if you don't know what's happening, you will eventually lose it. You know, let me just say this as a word of caution to everybody. Man, I love what's happened. And even, you know, last night with uh, Todd and there was people that were touched emotionally and that's wonderful. I'm not minimizing that at all. But you are not going to be able to live on an emotional high all of the time. Emotions come and go. And if all you're doing is trying to keep some kind of a feeling or emotion going, that's really counterproductive to what God has done because everything that God has done for us is in the spiritual realm and that is not a physical realm. Now it needs to affect our physical realm and I, again, man, praise God for all the lives that are changed. It's wonderful but it's going to be the knowledge. It's what you know that is going to last you long term. And so many people get touched by the Lord but they aren't able to maintain it. You know, real quickly, before I get right back into this, I'm going to try and make this very quick. But when the Lord touched my life, March the 23rd, 1968, I had this emotional encounter with the Lord. I mean, for four and a half months, I never slept more than one hour at a time. I never sat down and ate a meal. I was so excited about the Lord. I just grabbed something. I mean, I was going nearly 24 hours a day. Uh, I was... Uh, I was obnoxious, I'm sure, <laughs> but man, I was just excited about the Lord. And some of you will find a hard time believing these things, but honest, I'm telling you the truth. I was so turned on to the Lord that in church, I would scream, I would run. I remember the first time I ever heard Kenneth Copeland, Jeremy's granddad. I was over at uh, Brother Nichols' church in Fort Worth, and I had just gotten out of Vietnam 
And uh, he preached a message on faith. And I got so excited, I ran and circled that auditorium a number of times, screaming and yelling while he was preaching. <laughs> People just hardly can't believe that about me. <laughs> but what happened was, I got, I got so touched emotionally and I was passionate and I loved the Lord, but I didn't know the word. And as my emotions fluctuated, boy, I mean, I was feast or famine. It was either like, man, I was just overwhelmed with the presence of the Lord. Or sometimes I was so depressed that in Vietnam, I spent 13 months asking God to kill me, not because I was depressed uh, of what was happening in Vietnam, but I was just so in love with the Lord. And I just figured that you couldn't live on that level here on the earth, and I was ready to go to heaven. It wasn't because of Vietnam. I was just so in love with the Lord, and I couldn't seem to maintain what I had experienced. And I, so, uh, anyway, I went through a lot of rough, rough times. And then the Lord started showing me these things that I've been sharing with you. And what happened was, instead of me having just a feeling or an emotion that God loved me and an experience, I begin to start walking in what I know from the Word of God. And that sustains me 24 hours a day all of the time. And I still have great emotions. I'm not against emotions at all. But I transition from trying to just feel God to where I believed what the Word of God says. And that has become the stability of my life. And the reason I bring this out is to say that, man, many of you have been touched in a special way. God's done wonderful things here. And you aren't going to be able to always live on an emotional level. Matter of fact, when I talk about these kind of things, I've actually had people come up and say, would you please pray for me that I'd have an experience like you did? And I say, no, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. <laughs> and people think, what do you mean? Because you, in a sense, you become addicted to the feeling. You can become addicted to emotions. I tell you, when you feel the presence of the Lord, it's awesome. It is awesome. And you can become addicted to it and get to where you are just constantly seeking some feeling and things. And, and the Lord says without faith, it's impossible to please him. Did you know the Lord could make it so that every one of you would have, uh, I mean, you'd just be overwhelmed. And he could do things like that. But if he did, you would become addicted to it. And let's say that you have a devotional time and you ask the Lord, oh God, just touch me. And all of a sudden, I mean, miraculous things happen. You see angels, you hear voices and all kinds of things happen. The average person would be so excited that the next day, okay, God, what are you going to do today? And if he didn't do something bigger and better, you'd leave disappointed. The Lord wants you to know him by faith. The Lord is here with us. We've seen manifestations of it. I'm not saying that we don't ever experience any manifestation of these things, but we, we've had powerful demonstration of the presence of God. I think that everybody here would, would recognize that. Did you know God could just be doing things all of the time, but it wouldn't take faith? There's scriptures that says that no man can see the Lord and live. And it's not because God is so private that he doesn't want you to see him. And if you get a glimpse at him, he's going to kill you. That's not what it is. It's he's so awesome that we can't contain God. If you were to see the real glory of God, it would kill you. Your body would explode. God is so awesome that we cannot contain. And so in a sense, God has to hide himself through uh, he's in the spiritual realm. He's a spiritual being and he has, he's made it so that we can contact him by faith so that we can see him, so that we can hear him, so that we can feel him. But it's done by faith. If he wanted to, he could do all kinds of physical things, but it wouldn't take faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so anyway, I'm just saying that uh, you need to go home and Praise God for the awesome things he's done. Thank him for touching you. Thank him for opening up your eyes and do all of this. But then ultimately, you're going to have to get in the word of God is the only thing that will sustain this. 
And I can promise you, if I hadn't gotten in the Word of God, that experience I had with the Lord 56 years ago, it wouldn't be lasting today. Matter of fact, there, are, there was probably 10 or 12 people in that prayer meeting with me the night that God changed my life. And did you know every one of them was touched? But there's not a one of them today that's walking in that. Matter of fact, my best friend who is there, he's renounced the whole thing and thought it was nothing but emotion. And he's backed off the whole thing. And it didn't change other people. They, they were touched, but it didn't last because they didn't get into the Word. And I can tell you, even though God's done great things in your life, you've got to be in the Word. So anyway, that was all free. Here's Romans chapter 6 and uh, verse 8. And remember the things that we've already taught on this. It says, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Would everybody agree that death has no dominion over Jesus? I believe everybody would agree with that. And then it says, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. And this isn't just talking about individual sins. This is talking about you are dead. That old sin nature is dead, gone in non-existence. And you need to recognize yourself likewise to be dead to sin the same way that Jesus is dead to sin. Do you think that Jesus just died to sin 2,000 years ago, but now he's still in heaven and he's having to deal with sin and resist things? Man, he's totally overcome it. He is dead to it. And you likewise in your spirit being are dead to sin. You are incapable of sin. And you are now alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Again, brothers, you've already been set free. When you got born again, you are as free as you'll ever be. You know, Rico, that, uh, is Rico here? Is Rico still here? Are you here? Must be gone. But anyway, he's one that uh, Todd had stand up last night that got born again on Thursday and then delivered of the cocaine addiction yesterday morning. Did you know when he got born again, his spirit is as perfect and pure as any person in here that's been born again for 40 or 50 years. You don't get a baby spirit that is immature and it's got to grow. It's your soul that's growing. It's your ability to draw and to walk in what God has done that you're growing in. But your spirit, when you get born again, you don't get a baby spirit. You get a full grown spirit. Your spirit is as full grown and mature as Jesus is because it is the spirit of Jesus sent into your heart crying, Abba, Father. You are full grown. You're pointing, oh, is this Rico over here? There you are. You, you were sitting over there yesterday. All right, so anyway, brother, your spirit's as mature as my spirit as anybody's spirit. We've all got the spirit of Christ. You aren't just growing. That's what this is talking about right here. So it's already done. Now it's just a matter of are you going to walk in who you are in Christ? Are you going to walk in what you have? Or are you going to let this old way of thinking, your old life, dominate you? And I tell you, there's a lot of people that just think, well, I'm trying to just be real. What you're being is real carnal. <laughs> you're just letting your old self, that old nature and the way that it molded you and formed you, you're letting it control you. And that is not the real you. You are a brand new person. You need to claim that new identity. Thanks, Rico. I was just wanting to use you as an example. In verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And in verse 15, What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. And I dealt with this yesterday in verse 16. The second reason he gives in this chapter that you don't live in sin is because even though God is a spirit and sees you in the spirit and he doesn't see you as a sinner, he sees you as a saint, he sees what he's done in your life, 
He, he loves you, spirit, soul, and body. And if you yield your body and your soul to sin, Satan is going to take inroad. And that's what it says in verse 6, that know ye not that to whom ye... 16, excuse me, verse 16. It know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So if you yield yourself to sin, Satan will use that cooperation that you've given him to bring sickness, poverty, depression, discouragement, fear, worry, all kinds of things into your life. In verse 17, it says, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. <laughs> That's awesome. You're dead to that sin nature. And now, because you're dead, only if you're dead, only if you know that you're dead, are you now free from sin. Being made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. I speak at the manner of man because of the infirmity of your flesh. In other words, he'd been saying some really heavy things in this uh, uh, epistle. And he was saying things that were just so contrary to the way most people think that some people have trouble uh, grasping these things. So he says, all right, since, since some of you have trouble understanding this, I'm going to talk to you like a mere man. Instead of talking on a spiritual plane, let me just come down to this level and say that in the same way that you serve the devil, that's now how you need to serve God is basically what this verse is saying. With the same passion, the same commitment uh, to the way that we serve the devil, we now need to be serving God. So in verse 19, I speak after the manner of man because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Your born again spirit is righteous. It's in right standing with God. It's holy and pure. I, I used those verses yesterday, Ephesians 4, 24. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and in true holiness. Your born again spirit is created righteous and holy. And now you need to yield to it to become servants to uh, righteousness and unto holiness. And then look at this in verse 20. This is an amazing passage of scripture right here. In verse 20, it says, For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What does it mean? This is talking about before you got born again, you were free from righteousness. Is that saying that you couldn't do anything that was right? Is this saying that a person that doesn't know the Lord can't do anything good? That's not true. You can do good things. But what it's saying is when you are trapped in that sin nature, before that sin nature is taken away through the new birth, your good acts, and you can do good things before you're born again, but all of your goodness doesn't change your sinful nature. You can't change your nature by being good. You have to be born again. You need to be, have a new nature given to you. So this is saying before you're born again, your good actions couldn't change that sinful nature. Many people don't understand this. And so what they do, they say, I'm going to turn over a new life, a new leaf. I'm going to make a decision that from now on, I'm not going to dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. I'm going to live holy. I'm going to do this. And they think that somehow or another, they can change their life. Even if you could live perfectly from now until the end, which you can't do, but even if you could, that wouldn't erase all of the past that you've done. You need to be born again. True Christianity is not... Uh, behavior modification. It's not just changing your outward person. It's being changed on the inside. And so this is saying that before you have this change on the inside, before you get a new nature, all of your good works that you do are not going to change that old nature. And I believe that most people kind of understand that. Most people who've been born again recognize that they had to be born again. But look here in the context. In the next verse, it says in verse 21, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. 
But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. In verse 20, it says you were a servant of sin. That's talking about before you're born again. Now in verse 22, it says you become servants to God. So this is talking about after you're born again. And if in verse 20, it says you were free from righteousness, this didn't mean that you couldn't do something good, but it meant that your goodness couldn't change your uh, sinful nature. Down here in verse 22, now you are made free from sin. Does this mean that you can't sin? No, we all know by uh, experience that we can sin, but your sin can't change your born again nature any more than your goodness could change your sinful nature. Now that is a major statement right there because some people can think, well, when I got born again, I believe that Jesus forgave me and gave me this new nature, but I've messed up since then. You know, I referred to this briefly yesterday, but it says in Ephesians 1, 3, that once you believe you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise so that sin will penetrate your body and give Satan an inroad into you physically. It'll penetrate your soul and give Satan an inroad to your emotions and your thinking, but it can't penetrate the seal around your spirit. Your spirit retains its holiness. And this is what this is referring to. Once you're born again, that spirit is sealed you are now a brand new person and God sees you that way. Jeremy was making reference to this. Uh, Todd made reference to this. Many of you see yourself as, in, as uh, inadequate in so many different ways, but God sees you totally different. God is dealing with you based on who you are in the spirit, not based on your physical realm. Man, that is so important. You know, a, a good friend of mine, Don Crow, he helped me start the Bible college. Don, he was actually in my wedding 52, 50, yeah, 52 years ago. He was in my wedding. And uh, I've known Don a long, long time. And we've been friends. And anyway, I knew Don's dad. I knew his mother and sister. I went to his home in Ralston, Oklahoma. And anyway, his dad was a mean guy and, and they, had a, they had a farm and they had a lot of junk cars and uh, his dad would have Don help him work on things and his dad just con constantly condemned Don, the opposite of what uh, Jeremy was talking about. And anyway, Don got set free in many ways, but the way his dad treated, his dad actually wound up committing suicide and left a suicide note blaming all of the rest of the family and condemning them even in death. And uh, because of this, his dad used to tell Don, you're so stupid, you can't screw a nut on a bolt without cross-threading it. And he told him that so many times that when Don was 40 years old, we would work on a car and I would see Don literally shake, putting a nut on a bolt because of the curse that was placed over him. And he saw himself that way. And I never saw Don put a nut on a bolt without ultimately cross-threading it. He would put it on and it would be right and he would think maybe I did it wrong. And so he'd take it off and he'd keep doing it until every single time he cross-threaded. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And did you know that many of us, whether it's a person or whether it's just circumstances in life, many of you have an opinion about yourself that limits what God can do. And this is one of the things that God did in my life in 2002, January the 31st, he told me I was limiting him by my small thinking. Now, I knew what God's will for my life was. If you would have asked me back in 2002, what does God want this ministry to be like? I knew it was supposed to be a worldwide ministry. Everything that we're doing now and even more than what we're doing now, the Lord showed me and I could have told you that this is the direction we're headed. But I didn't see myself doing it. I had an opinion about myself that limited God. And God spoke to me from Psalm 78, 41 and said that uh, in their heart, they turned back and limited the Holy One of Israel. And God said, you're limiting me by your small thinking. Now, again, I knew what God told me to do. There's many of you that through this week, you can see that now you are a new person and that you are dead to that old man and that you don't have to live certain ways. And so you have information, but you have to take that information and let it paint a picture on the inside of you of who you are. 
and what you can do. And the way this works with me, I'm saying these things very quickly. I got a lot more detail in a book entitled The Power of Imagination. But the way it works with me, I have to get truth. I have to get understanding of something. And then I just meditate on it. Man, I hadn't got time to explain this, but in uh, Psalms chapter one, verse two, it says, in his law doth he meditate day and night. And then in Psalms chapter two, verse one, it says that why do the heathen imagine a vain thing? Did you know the word imagine and meditate are the exact same Hebrew word? So I believe that when you uh, meditate on something, you have to imagine it. You have to see it. You have to let it paint a picture on the inside of it. So it's one thing to hear that you have the same spirit in you that's in Christ, that you can do all things through Christ. It's one thing to have that piece of information and be able to quote it and maybe even give the reference where it is in the Bible. But do you see yourself doing it? And see, this is what I hadn't done. I hadn't let myself see me doing what I knew God had called me to do, what he said about me, but I thought it was pride for me to sit there and, and think of me having a large ministry and doing things. And I just wouldn't let myself go there. And you can't go anywhere in your physical body that you haven't already been in your imagination. That's a huge statement. That is huge. And this, it, it has effects on both sides. Did you know in the negative side, you can't commit adultery. You can't lie. You can't steal. You can't do anything in the negative that you haven't already been there in your heart. You can't do anything that you haven't done. It's like if you were underground and if you were trying to, you know, dig out a, a place, you would have to excavate something and remove the rock and the dirt before you could go and stand in that place. You just can't walk underground. You have to dig a tunnel. You have to hollow something out. You have to do that same thing in your mind in your imagination specifically. Did you know that the verse over in Isaiah chapter 26, verse three, that's a real popular verse. Many people quote it, but it says the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. The word for mind there is the Hebrew word yetzer, Y-E-T-S-E-R. And it's used about, uh, I think, nine times in the Old Testament. In six or seven of those times, it's translated imaginations. Genesis chapter six, verse five, the Lord saw that the imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. It's that same Greek word. So when it says that the Lord will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon him, it's talking about imagination. It's not just talking about thoughts, individual thoughts, but you have to let those thoughts paint a picture on the inside of you. So I'm saying all of these things because many of you have seen that you're dead to sin, that you've got this new nature, you've got information now, but you've got to take that and meditate on it until it paints a picture on the inside of you and that you see yourself as Jesus is. You see yourself doing what Jesus said you can do. And see, that's the next step in this. God has touched many of you. You've heard things. You've gotten revelation. But you've got to focus on it until it becomes clear. It's like in your mind, you can see something, but it's vague. And the more you focus on it, it becomes more and more in focus. You get to where you see it clearer and clearer. You know, I had seen a man raised from the dead in Pritchett, Colorado back in, that would have been about uh, 78 or something like that. And I'd seen another man raised from the dead in a meeting in Kansas City. And so I'd seen a couple of people raised from the dead, but it was somewhere around 2000 and, uh, it would have been 2001 exactly is when it was. In 2001, I was reading in John chapter 14, verse 12, where Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father. And I was reading that and I was thinking about, Father, I've seen some people raised from the dead, but it's been 10 years or something. I said, man, I want to see more people raised from the dead. So you know what I did? I took every instance in the Bible 
where somebody was raised from the dead. There's eight individual instances outside of Jesus' resurrection. And when he rose from the dead, it says in Matthew that many came out of their graves and walked into the city of Jerusalem. But if you exclude those that are just a reference to it, if you look at individual instances, there's only eight times in the Bible that somebody was raised from the dead. So I took all of those and I wrote them out and I begin to meditate on those things and not only see Jesus did it and not only believe that the dead could be raised, but I started believing that I could do it because he said I would do the same works. And then I begin, I, I got all the information about Elijah and Elisha and uh, Paul and Peter that raised people from the dead, Jesus that raised people. I got the information, but then I began to meditate on it. And I literally saw myself, lay, I laid on a bed and acted like Elisha, putting my hands upon the boy's hands, my mouth upon his mouth, and I laid on him. And then I got up and believed that he sneezed seven times. And then I went back and did it again. And I saw myself standing in front of Lazarus' tomb and saying, Lazarus, come forth with a loud voice. And I, I not only saw Jesus doing it, but I meditated on it until I saw me doing it. And, you know, I'm a lucid dreamer. And when I dream, man, my dreams are in color. I dream all of the time. I go to sleep. I, it's hard for me to tell if I'm awake or asleep because I'm, I'm thinking. And I can tell you what I'm thinking all night long. And, and uh, anyway, I begin in my dreams to raise people from the dead. I would raise 20 or 30 people a night from the dead. And I did this for six months or something. And I got to where I was so focused on it that I not only saw Elijah and Elisha and Peter and Paul and Jesus raising people from the dead, I saw me raising people from the dead. And then I got a call at four o'clock in the morning on March the 4th, uh, 2001. And my oldest son said, Dad, I'm sorry to tell you, but Peter, my youngest son, is dead. And because I had been meditating on it and I not only knew that it could happen, and I not only knew where the scriptures were to quote it, but I had seen myself doing it. Did you know Jamie and I spoke our faith and my son was raised from the dead after being dead for over four hours, stripped naked in a cooler, in a morgue with a toe tag on. Between four and five hours dead, sat up and started talking and has no brain damage. He's the one that put this LED screen up. He's the one that drives our truck and drives it up. And see, there, there's people that know what the word says. They know that, you know, you go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. You can quote the scripture. But have you seen yourself doing it? You can't go anywhere in your body that you haven't already been in your heart, specifically in your imagination. And, you know, there's a man, Jim Baker, who pastors in Columbus, Ohio, and he, had, he pastors a church there and he put out what he called the Andrew Womack Challenge. And he taught this to his church and told them what I did. And he said, how many of you will take the Andrew Womack Challenge? And they took all of the scriptures and began to meditate on it. And then they began to start seeing themselves doing that. And did you know, and I forget the exact period of time, but in one year, his church has seen 16 people raised from the dead through doing that same thing. Did you know that every one of you in here are commanded to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead? It's one thing to know that you have been commanded to do it. It's another thing to see that God has given you that power and authority. But now you got to focus on it, meditate on it to where you not only have the information, but you see yourself doing it. And so I'm saying these things to encourage you that, man, God has done some miraculous things here this weekend. I believe it's powerful. You've been touched. But it's one thing to be touched, to experience it, but then to continually live it. You're going to have to get these truths and you are going to have to see who you are in Christ Jesus and see what you can do. And it's going to have to get to where it is more real to you than what the physical realm says. And this is a real struggle in the body of Christ in most people's lives. Most of us have been taught how to be totally controlled by our feelings, by our emotions, by our natural perceptions. And the victory in the Christian life is walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. 
And walking in the Spirit isn't being weird. It's not having your collar turned around backwards. It's not going around, you know, with a sick look on your face or whatever people consider to be holiness. Walking in the Spirit is just walking in the Word. Getting to where you go by what the Word says rather than what you feel and what you see. It is really that simple. But it's not that easy. The hardest thing you'll ever do is reprogram your brain to where what you believe is more real to you than what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. But you can do it. I'm not a perfect example of this, but man, I've headed this direction and, and it's working to a large degree and I'm seeing some good things happen. You know, my board about, I forget how long ago, 20 years ago or something, made me go get a physical because they wanted me to get an insurance policy on me in case something happened. So anyway, well, it was, I can tell you exactly when it was. It was in uh, 2002 because it was right after my son or no, it's 2001. It's right after my son had been raised from the dead. It's just a couple of months after. And so anyway, they wanted me to go get a physical. And so they uh, put, on, put me on a treadmill test and they wanted to shave this hair on my chest. And I said, this is virgin hair. I said, you can't shave this hair off my chest. So they put these electrodes on, but, but they didn't shave the hair on my chest. And so anyway... Uh, I was witnessing to them. There was a doctor and a nurse in there the whole time. And I was witnessing, and I was telling them about my son being raised from the dead. And man, they were just all ears. And I was talking to them about all of this. And anyway, at the 12 minute and 53 second mark in this thing, it was a 15 minute test. And they told me that you can quit anytime you want to if you're tired. But I just went the whole time. And anyway, at the 12 minute and 53 second mark, these things started falling off because I was sweating. And so I was holding two of them. A nurse was holding two. The doctor was holding two as I was still running. And uh, so anyway, I finished the treadmill test and then he got this long printout and he started looking at it and going through this thing. And uh, when he got to the 12 minute and 53 second spot, he, he started grunting and boy, looked at me. And then he got this piece of paper and wrote down here. He says, now you go to this person. I've got an appointment scheduled. You don't go back to the office. You go over there. You've got a serious heart problem and we're going to put you in the hospital and we might do open heart surgery on you before the day's over. And it took me just a few seconds to sit there and listen to this guy because I didn't feel a thing. Everything was fine. And I mean, for maybe 10 seconds or something, I just looked at him and I said, that's a lie. And he just looked at me. I guess he wasn't used to people calling him a liar. And I said, that's a lie. I said, you look at that thing and tell me that that says I got a serious heart problem. And he, he started backing up and he said, well, it doesn't say you have it. It's just there was a little anomaly. And of course, he didn't even mention that the things were falling off of my chest. I think that could have made a difference. He never even thought about that. He just said, you got a serious heart problem. And I said, you told me I had a serious heart problem. He says, well... You know, everybody's heart's a little different. It might be okay. We just, I think we ought to go get it checked. And I said, that's not what you told me. You lied to me. And I got on this guy's case and started telling him, how dare you tell me I got a serious heart problem. And he just tore this piece of paper up and said, uh, leave. <laughs> and he kicked me out of his office. And did you know on the way back to my office, there was on a hill, there was a woman's car who died on her and it was blocking traffic. And I got out and by myself pushed her car up the hill and around the corner to get it out of traffic. And I thought that's pretty good for a guy with a serious heart problem. <laughs> and anyway, I, I've got a doctor on my board and I went to Shreveport and he did a EKG or I don't know what they call it, but he did a test on me where they put a dye in you and then do all of these things. And he said, I had the heart of a 17 year old. And then he told me, he says, don't ever, ever accept one of those treadmill tests. They're wrong as often as they're right. He says they're over 50% wrong. And yet most people, if a doctor was to tell you something, you would just fold like a $2 suitcase. But did you know the difference was I'd been meditating in the word and I knew what the word said about me. And I just, I, what I believed was more real to me than what somebody was telling me. And 
You know, I ha I've hesitated to say these things because I don't want your unbelief. But now I'm on the other side of this, so I'm going to give you a testimony of what just happened to me two years ago. I moved over here, and there's a little hill in between me and my house. And I walked over here, and then on the way back, it is that steep. It is very, very steep. It's probably a 30, 40% grade, and I got winded, and I just refused to quit walking. And so I pushed myself until I literally just fell on the ground. And I mean, I thought my heart was coming out of my chest. And for a couple of months, I couldn't walk from here to the front row without being out of breath. And I mean, I had pain. My hands were going numb, pain down both arms, which I didn't go to a doctor and check it out. But I can guarantee you, I've dealt with a lot of people and that's signs of a heart attack or of a blockage or something. And if I'd have gone to the doctor, they'd have done surgery on me. And you know what? I just stood and believed God. And I'm now up to walking. Uh, this week, I've walked seven miles one day. I walked four miles an hour pace, which is a pretty good pace. I'm back. All of the symptoms are gone. I haven't said anything to anybody for two years because I didn't want to hear your unbelief. <laughs> but you know what? I stood and believed God because I see that I have this power on the inside of me. And I've overcome all that stuff. And I'm not against doctors. If it wasn't for doctors, all the Christians would be dead because they certainly hadn't been believing God. But I'm saying, uh, I'm not against you. If you want to go to a doctor and get them to cut your chest open and go through all that stuff, have at it. But don't criticize me for believing God. And God has healed me and I'm totally over it. Amen. I am healthy to the max. So I'm just saying you got to not only get this information, but you got to meditate on it until what you see in the word and what you see in your heart is more real to you than what you see with your physical eyes. And this is where the vast majority of Christians miss it. Most Christians know more than what they believe. It's like Jeremy was talking about getting equipped and then I was talking to him back there in the green room. I said, I could just see him standing there with all this equipment looking great, but then not using it. <laughs> That's what a lot of Christians do. They've got all of this equipment, but they aren't using it. They're more in touch with their feelings. And so I'm just encouraging. I believe God has done some great things here this week. But man, you are a brand new person. I wanted to get into Romans chapter 7, but let me just summarize the first four verses. He talks about marriage. He compares this to marriage and he says, the only way to get out of being married to an old man is to have the old man die. And he's using this to illustrate what he taught in the sixth chapter, that your old man is dead. And he says, if a woman goes out and marries another person while her first husband is still alive, then she's called an adulteress. And what it's saying is, if you had two natures, then you would be living in spiritual adultery. You can't marry Jesus until that old man dies. And that old man is dead and gone, and there is no dual nature on the inside of you. And uh, man, I wish I had time to get into Romans chapter 7, the end of part of it. But anyway, you are a brand new person. You've got to see it. You've not only got to see it intellectually, but you've got to see it in your heart and get to where it dominates and controls you. So brothers, I want to encourage you to, to believe that God brought you here for something special. He spoke special things to you. We have seen hundreds of people's lives miraculously touched. You've got information now that you didn't have before, but for it to really cause freedom in your life, you're going to have to take the word and meditate on it. And it's going to have to get to where it is more real to you than what you can see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. And I think it was Jeremy that brought this out that Jesus could do no, home, no mighty work in his hometown because, except that he laid his hand on a few uh, people because of their unbelief. When you go back home, you're going to be changed. But did you know what? You got the same body. You're going to look the same. And you're going to have family, friends, co-workers, treat you like you're the same. You will have circumstances try and treat you like the same. You've got to recognize that you've changed. 
And it'll take time. And you can't demand other people to just immediately accept that you've changed because you've tried to change before. You probably told them you changed before and it didn't work. <laughs> you don't go in and demand people to accept that you're a brand new person. You need to prove it to them. But you need to see yourself regardless of what family, friends, co-workers say about you, circumstances. You may go back and have the same financial problems that you have. You may have the same physical problems, same relational problems, but you've changed on the inside. All of us who are born again are changed and many of you have seen it, got a glimpse of it. Now you're going to have to convince yourself and get to a place that you don't waver. You're going to act like this new person regardless of what anybody says about you. And regardless of any failures that you have, because this is a process. And I can promise you, you won't just go back and never make another mistake. You will make some mistakes. You know, if you're a type of person that swore and used profanity, you can get delivered. Sometimes people get delivered of that instantly because it was demonic. You can get delivered of a demon and instantly be over it. But with most people, it's not, it's inspired by the devil, but it's carnal. It's your flesh. You have taught yourself how to do this. And if it's the flesh you're dealing with, you can't cast the flesh out. You have to just work with it and deal with it. So some of you may have some instantaneous things if you were totally demon possessed and set free. But with the majority of us, it's just the flesh we're dealing with and you may make mistakes and have some problems along the way. But man, it's true that in the Spirit you're totally free and as quickly as you can renew your mind, you can begin to start walking in this freedom. Isn't that good? Man, I believe that this is going to be life-changing for many of you. And, and we may never meet again. I may never hear about it in this life. But when we get to heaven, you can come by my mansion and tell me <laughs> about what God did during this meeting. Amen. And I'd love to hear the full story. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So let's stand up. Let me pray for you. Father, we are just so thankful for everything that you've done for us. We pray that you give us a heart to understand, eyes to see. Luke 24, 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Father, we are praying that you open up our heart. And I know that there's been many people's lives changed. I know that you've done great things. People have been healed and, and delivered of things. Father, we thank you for it. But we pray that that revelation of what's happened becomes real in us, that it gets solidified in us so that Satan is not able to steal this word from us. Father, I pray that you give us eyes to see, as Jeremy was talking about with Saul, that we would just become another man. We would become the new man that you've made us. Father, give men the ability to go home and humble themselves and apologize for the way that they've done and say that they're they're a new man. Father, I pray that you give us favor. Thank you, just like Todd shared last night, that his wife was already born again when he came back. Father, I pray that people, when they get back, that their wife has been changed while they were gone, that they'll be receptive. Father, we just believe that the things that you've done here are not going to be temporary, but they will be permanent. That you'll help us to totally readjust our thinking that we will leave this place walking like the changed man that we really are. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, we thank you. And I know that Satan will throw things at us trying to get us to back up and take our attention off of you. But just like Peter, Father, I pray that we keep our focus on Jesus. We walk on top of every circumstance that comes against us and we are not going to sink. We are looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith and what you've done for us. So, Father, we just receive it. We solidify it. We cement these things in our life. And we believe that, Father, it's never going to be the same. Amen. That we are transformed people. We are leaving here brand new. Thank you, Jesus. And so, Father, we agree and we receive that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. 
Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask our prayer ministers to come down here in case there's anybody. We've ministered to you so many times, but if there's anything we can do before you leave, we would be glad to pray with you. So any way we can help you, please come down here and take advantage. Is there anything you want to say, Mike? Okay, Mike's got some final words here. Let me just mention, I, don't, I noticed when I drove out last night that they, there was a, somebody trying to turn left on the Highway 24 out of the right lane and they realized that they were in that right lane and so they just put on their blinker and held everybody up. It's a double left turn. So in case you didn't know that, that'll speed things up as you exit. All right, thank you, God bless you. All right guys, what a great time together in the Word. Amen. Awesome. Guys, just to, just to remind you that uh, we do have our resources still open back there, so please check us out. Our cafe is open as well. We have some grab-and-go snacks that are available back there. If you want to go back there, our conference, the recording of this conference should be ready here in the next couple minutes. Probably maybe even by the time you get out there, it, should, it may be ready. So uh, feel free to grab this conference and take it home with you. It's important to keep on reminding ourselves what the Lord spoke to us during this time. We have a couple of events coming up over this next short season. On March 29th and 30th, we have a David, the King of Jerusalem, and a Spring Market happening here. For those of you who want to watch it from home, you can live stream it as well. Just check out our website. April 3rd through the 5th, we have our Karis Campus Days. So if you're interested in coming to Karis Bible College next year here on campus, check out those Campus Days. It's going to be kind of a taste of what happens here at Karis Bible College. July 1st through the 5th, we're going to be having our Summer Family Bible Conference as well. So begin making plans with your family even right now to come on and bring your family here. It's a great time. More performances, a time specifically to minister to the kids, to the youth. They're going to be getting the exact same thing that you will be getting here as adults. August 6th through 9th, we have our Healing is Here. And then August, uh, I'm sorry, September 6th and the 7th, we have a Karis 30th year anniversary, 30 years of Karis Bible College. It's a great time to come and celebrate us, celebrate with us. And then we have one final GTC. Andrew's going on the road for the last time for doing a Gospel Truth Conference in Dallas, Texas. That's uh, October 31st through November 2nd. So you can check out our website and find out more from there as well. Guys, if you lost anything, please check out our lost and found. And as Andrew said, just be careful going on the roads. It's going to be a single line down to the gatehouse. You can take two, two right-hand turns onto Trout Creek Road. And then you can take uh, from either lane, left-hand left -hand lane or right-hand lane, you can take a, a left onto uh, County Road or onto uh, 25. So guys, thank you so much for coming during this time. We believe that you are blessed, and from this moment forward, things will never be the same. Amen. Thank you, guys. We look forward to seeing you again really soon.